Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to talk about stock market bubbles, okay? And, you know, is the stock market a bubble right now? Um, what inspired this, I saw a post on LinkedIn uh, today from Gary Mishuris. If you're on LinkedIn, I highly recommend following Gary Mishuris. He puts out some really awesome, uh, timely, concise content around value investing, uh, intelligent stock market investing. And I also, as I was researching um, my video yesterday, I came across uh, a talk by Monish Pabrai where he kind of went through some past bubbles, okay? And I, I thought that was really interesting because um, it, when you're in a bubble, it can be very hard to know that you're in a bubble. It's easy to get swept up by sort of the, the frenzy and the excitement that, that happens in a bubble. And this belief that, you know, this thing is going to the moon, okay? And fear of missing out becomes, you know, the thing to act upon rather than, you know, doing a thorough analysis of your investment. Um, and that's why you see people pile in very quickly and stock prices tend to go up uh, very fast. Um, whereas, you know, the underlying financials of the businesses where these stocks are going up really fast, you know, there's, there's nothing really that's changed to justify the rapid increase in price. Um, so I just want to share a little bit first about that talk from Pabrai, and I will link to that. It's uh, it's fantastic. Even if you just watch like the first 30 minutes or so, there's just so much good stuff in there about, you know, past bubbles and patterns that show up again and again in these bubbles. So, you know, Pabrai really highlighted three major bubbles in the last um, century. In the 1920s, ending in 1932, we had an auto bubble, okay? There were hundreds of car companies, right? And, you know, the investment thesis there was, hey, you know, the U.S. population is going to rise. It's going to rise significantly from here. Uh, the population of the U.S. was around 100, just north of 100 million at that time in the 1920s. And it did. Obviously, it, it went up, you know, 3x or more. We're somewhere in the 300 millions today. So that was true. Um, the other thesis was the country was going to industrialize, right? And more and more people were going to own cars. And that turned out to be true. Massively true. Um, basically, I don't, I don't know the figures, but I imagine there's probably as many cars in the U.S. as there are people, okay? Maybe even more. Um, so the, the, the reality of the situation is that nearly everyone who invested in the auto industry in the early 1920s lost their entire investment, okay? Now, the moral of the story there is just because an industry is, is going to do fantastically well moving forward does not mean any individual company is going to do well moving forward. Uh, there were, like I said, there were hundreds of auto manufacturers in uh, the 1920s. By 1932, there were essentially three okay, in the U.S. So that was not good for investors. Um, in the 19, early 1960s, there was a Tronix bubble. And, uh, you know, I'll let you watch Pabrai's talk if you want to learn more about that. But um, basically any, any company that attached Tron to their name uh, shot up, uh, which, you know, the next one obviously is the 2000 dot com bubble, where any company that had a dot com attached to it you know, just went to the moon. It seemed like no price was too high for a company like that because, you know, the future was so bright for the internet, right? Um, and we all know what happened with the dot-com bubble. Uh, I sense there was, 
perhaps a bubble in, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, from the beginning of 2017 to the end of 2017, you know, Bitcoin, I think, was around, um, it was under $1,000 in the beginning of 2017. By the end of 2017, it had hit $20,000. So it was up more than 20x in one year. Uh, and it certainly felt like a bubble. I, I remember, you know, I was paying attention to it. I didn't own any Bitcoin at that time, but I was certainly aware of, you know, that there was a mania happening uh, in, in, the, in the realm of cryptocurrency. It seemed like nothing could go wrong buying cryptocurrency at that time, even at $20,000 for a Bitcoin. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a feeling to be in the middle of one of these bubbles. Um, and I just want to share a few, a few things from Gary Mishuris, uh, who I mentioned from LinkedIn. He's talking about signs of a bubble because it's, you know, it's really important to be aware of when you're in a bubble, not necessarily to, to sell. Um, it can certainly be a good opportunity to sell, but to avoid or prevent getting swept up in the mania and buying at a price that really can't be justified by, you know, the fundamentals of the business. You know, the balance sheet, the income statement, you know, what is the business doing? What are, what are the numbers backing up the business? Um, so signs of a bubble, you know, stocks are bought based on belief rather than thorough analysis, okay? This is that FOMO. People feel like they don't have time to really evaluate uh, an investment. They're gonna miss out if they don't buy now. That's, that's really the flavor of being in a bubble. Um, and the story is much more important than the numbers, right? Uh, in a bubble, the story is, you know, we're just at the beginning. This thing is gonna be huge. Um, and anyone who's not getting in now is going to get left behind. That's, that's basically the story. Uh, and the numbers don't matter because, um, you know, the numbers now simply can't, you know, don't have any relevance to what's going to happen in the future. Okay. Uh, this thing is just going to go to the moon. The numbers now don't matter. Um, Another thing, a narrow group of companies is perceived to be so valuable that any company seen as belonging to this group of companies is valued at extraordinary levels. I think we're really seeing this now in the electric vehicle industry. Um, Tesla, I mean, Tesla, what a story, right? What a story Tesla has been. And you know, you're seeing all of these, a bunch of these small electric vehicle startups trading at just insane prices because a lot of people missed out on Tesla. And they think, well, you know, if that happened for Tesla, maybe it has something to do with this electric vehicle niche. Maybe, maybe I need to have money in that. And so, you know, any company that's associated with Tesla or that could be the next Tesla um, fits that story of, you know, maybe this will be like Tesla. I missed out on Tesla, but, you know, I, I can't miss out again. Uh, you know, I've got to gotta buy Neo or Nikola or Workhorse or whatever it is. There, there's, the, the list is endless. Um, and then finally, doubters are dismissed, right? So in a healthy investment environment, there are people who um, are bullish on the stock and there are people who are bearish on the stock. People who think it's gonna go up, people who think it's gonna go down. And, you know, usually in investors kind of weigh both sides before getting into that investment, right? They, they wanna assess the potential upside of the investment and they also want to look at the risk, the risk of losing money in the investment. Now, in a bubble, that 
uh, analysis of the risk, that analysis of what are my odds of losing money here. In a bubble, that kind of goes away. Okay, that's you know that's really secondary. Uh, almost uh, it's it kind of gets lost in the picture of people focus on how high could this thing go. You know, how exciting is this upside? Look 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 at how high this might go. Uh, and investors forget about risk. They forget about the downside. There's always a downside. Uh, intelligent investment is really about assigning kind of a rational set of probabilities to both the, the possibility of upside and the magnitude of upside versus the possibility of losing money and how much money could be lost. Uh, it's really important to have the whole picture of both ends when, when you're getting into an investment. When you're in a bubble, people forget about the bottom. They forget about that bottom end, the, uh, the risk of losing money end. Um, and bubbles, bubbles have happened throughout history. You know, the, the first one back I think I can remember is tulip mania. I think that was in the 1700s um, where people were buying these rare varieties of tulips um, because prices kept going up. Uh, and they thought, well, I can spend a ton of money on this now because someone tomorrow is going to pay me a ton of money plus a little bit more. So, you know, it's, it's a pattern that's, I think, never going to go away. It's human nature, uh, these, these bubbles. Um, it's really the kind of the greed that comes in as something, as the stocks start rising and um, people pile in, there's social proof. You see your neighbor piling in, you see all of these intelligent people buying in and you think, well, we can't all be wrong, but that's exactly what happens uh, in a bubble. When it pops, everyone's wrong. Who, who was buying in to drive up the price. All, all those people end up uh, hurting big time in their investment portfolios. So it's a pattern that recurs throughout investing history. It, it's, it's an important pattern to recognize as investors because it's easy to get swept up into um, and it's terrible, like I said, for your investment portfolio. So, I mean, Buffett's rule number one is don't lose money. And the definition of a bubble, you know, you're buying at inflated prices and when it pops, you're left holding a, a virtually worthless asset. So, um, and what's interesting about Pabrai's, uh, Monish Pabrai's beginnings as an investor, he really benefited from the dot-com bubble. So he bought, he put a million dollars in 14 different stocks. Um, in 1995, most, most of it was in 10 stocks in the US. And out of those 14 stocks, two of them went up 100x, okay? One of them he had $100,000 in. So that went from 100,000 to 10 million. That, you know, radically changed, uh, obviously, his portfolio. Uh, another one he had $15,000 in. So that went to 1.5 million. So you're talking about two stocks out of 14 that took this portfolio from a million to 11.5 million, okay? Two stocks. So, and he had the, the wherewithal to sell near the peak, you know, during 2000, 2001. So, you know, that, that's just a testament to his level headedness to be able to cash out in the midst of a bubble. Um, so, you know, bubbles aren't necessarily bad, right? Uh, they can be very good for your portfolio if you can recognize them and cash out at the appropriate time. Uh, when they're bad is when you get swept up into them and make emotional decisions. Uh, and buy at prices that are too high. And then, you know, things don't turn out well. So I just wanted to share kind of some of these anecdotes because um, I see a lot of bubble-like 
kind of activity, bubble-like energy in the stock market these days, um, especially in the electric vehicle area. Um, I mean, even like Amazon, Netflix, companies that are obviously great companies, but have a price to earnings ratio above 100. Uh, Amazon was like 147, something like that. Uh, it's hard to imagine that ending well for investors. I think Amazon is gonna do great moving forward, uh, but investors who are buying at those prices, you know, it, it's hard to see a lot of upside when you buy at a price to earnings ratio over 100. So um, I don't know if we're in a bubble. I think there are corners of the market that are in a bubble, um, but it's important to be able to recognize uh, bubble-like characteristics uh, so that you can avoid paying too much for for your stocks because I mean that's that's the biggest mistake that investors make is overpaying even if it's a great business so with that uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with those thoughts let me know if you guys have uh, any insights uh, about past experiences from from being in a bubble be uh, fascinated to hear about those. And um, like I said, watch that uh, lecture with Monish Pabrai. Even if you just get through the, uh, his talk, his piece on bubbles, it's uh, very illuminating. All right, guys, I will leave you with that, and I will see you tomorrow. Take care.